2020 is well in the books by now, which means it's time for me to do what everyone else has long since done. Make a video talking about my favorite games of 2020! I opened last year's video by saying it was a garbage year. Can you believe how stupid that was? To set things up here, this will be like 2019's video. I just want to talk about games I played that I otherwise didn't cover on this channel, or did cover and just still have something to say. I realized at a point that my top 10 videos mostly just go over games I'd already covered on the channel that year, so this is less of a games of the year, and more of a assorted games I didn't have anywhere else to talk about affair. And by spending most of this year at home, and still somehow catching COVID-19 a month back, wonderful, I played a decent amount. So be warned, light to medium spoilers may be shown without context or discussed with slight context. I promise there won't be much of that, but if you see me transitioning to a game you don't want to know about, uh, be careful. Also, quick apologies up front if I use trailer footage or footage doesn't really match what I talk about well. My hard drive space was limited this year, so I don't have exact footage for most of this really. So to get this one out of the way up front. Our Apex Legends crew lost Token Geek, but the Golden Bolt, Justin, and myself carried on strong with the game all the way through the year. We're quickly approaching the game's second anniversary, which I hate thinking about because good lord what is time, and it still managed to hold our attention pretty well. The game gets content updates just quickly enough to keep us on the hook, let us take some time away from the game, and then bring us back in to see what changes were made. And I gotta say, most of the bigger changes have been for the better. Not to mention that the game has retained its fantastic feeling controls and game to game rhythm. And while not all of the new characters have been hits, none of them have outright ruined anything at least. The game recently added its third map into the rotation and it's genuinely a fantastic FPS arena. It does the best job of any map in the game of having a variety of different locations to get into encounters in, and feels so much more expansive than it actually is. The map is so good that it almost feels a shame when the other map in the rotation pops into play. All that said, as a group, it's beginning to feel like we're looking at the end of our time with Apex in 2021, but it's such an easy game to just hop on and shoot the shit over that I imagine we'll still go strong with it for at least most of the year. I personally have hit the 1000 hour mark with it, by the way, and uh, no, <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. Okay, so now is when I get to bring the mood down some. Animal Crossing is a series I've loved ever since becoming obsessed with the original game on the GameCube as a kid. I just flat out adored it and begged my parents to google info about Animal Crossing 2 far too often. Ever since then, I've eagerly anticipated each mainline release, aside from City Folk, sorry City Folk, and New Horizons was no exception. Unfortunately, with time and my own weird neuroses, it's probably become the hardest entry in the series for me to play as time has gone on. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly why, as I think it made some positive changes. Uh, let's have a meandering conversation here and just talk it out so you get where I'm coming from. Crafting is a fine addition to Animal Crossing, and it's one that makes a lot of sense. It's cool to keep finding new recipes and trying to gather the materials to craft them, but I don't often feel like I'm finding recipes in such a way that I can create interesting or consistent themes within my home. I've been aiming to make an arcade in my basement all year, and thanks to some buddies I was able to make a decent dent in that goal, but now that my friends have largely fallen off the game, I have to rely on Nook's store. In prior games, there were multiple upgrades to the shop that continually increased the available selection. Here, not so much. It's these four or five item slots, and I just feel like I keep seeing the same items far too often. Should I connect online and coordinate with strangers on message boards to get what I want? <sighs> Probably, but the game's online services are just a hassle to deal with, as I'm sure we're all beyond well aware of by now. And in a thing that is largely my own fault, I won't act like it isn't, the thought of playing New Horizons just stresses me out. Tools can now break, which will require going out of my way to a crafting table on my island and using resources that I have to replenish to make replacement tools. I have no indication on when these tools will break, short of laboriously tracking each usage of the tool I commit to, and I just don't enjoy the uncertainty that every move I make could be the one to make me drop my focus to go replace a broken tool in a game I come to for comfort and to not think about this kind of thing. I'd love to keep filling my museum up as another example, but I just hate to keep distracting myself from my task when I least expect it to go make another tool that will break. Checking in so frequently and hardly ever finding red to put paintings in my museum is a chore on top of it all. The only new addition I've made to my museum in months has been a dung beetle while I was doing the toy day event the other week, and 
don't even get me started on the events. Anyway, again, on paper, crafting was a good idea. I just wish I could work toward tool upgrades that are permanent. It'd be a nice sense of progression and help shift my perspective if I could just eventually have unbreakable items. I also just wish more of the series staples would have been added in by now. Like, I know at some point in 2021, they'll probably patch in a new store upgrade to unlock, because Animal Crossing is a live game now, which, again, is a change that makes total sense. But the more I try to invest into New Horizons, the more I feel repelled by it. Offsetting all my weird quirks, though, is the remaining fact that I really enjoyed a lot of my time up front with the game. It was a really solid content treadmill at first, as well as a nice change of pace from the other entries, and seeing millions of people across the world coming to the series I've always enjoyed and building memories of their own was truly a delight. It gives me the same feeling that I get seeing more and more people come into the Yonkasa series. I'm just so glad to see people coming in and loving these weird things that I hold dear. Anyway, that's my Animal Crossing rant. It's off my chest. Most of it is just my brain refusing to let go and let me enjoy my silly talking animal game. Hopefully in 2021, I can relax a bit on it and get back into it. Uh, we'll see. Shortly after New Horizons came out, the Panzer Dragoon remake stealth launched on Switch, and, uh, well, I have a video covering that initial release, and a follow-up video on when they released a substantial patch for it that improved things. It's now out on PC platforms in the PS4, and I, I truthfully don't have much to say about it beyond what I said in those videos, but the publisher gave me a Steam code at some point, so I, I just wanted to shout out that playing through a game like this with a mouse and keyboard is, well, weirdly easy, but an interesting experience? Uh, maybe worth a second playthrough for that reason when it's on sale. It's also a bit sad to me that the game launched on PC, and then had to patch in things like VSync options and the like days afterwards. It, it was bare bones at release. But it's another fine version of this remake by now, if you were curious. It's just continually weird to me that not only did Panzer Dragoon get remade, but it launched in such weird conditions and in such a shame of a state multiple times. It's also a game that takes an hour to play through and has an achievement for playing 100 hours of it? What? I still think Panzer Dragoon deserves better than it got here, but it's decent for what it is now. And at least the series is like, kinda alive again? Just man, this game happened, right? Like, <laughs> odd. I'm gonna jump ahead to May here, when I popped online with Justin to experience another licensed out Sega IP that fared ridiculously better in its execution by comparison, Streets of Rage 4, a name that still doesn't feel quite real. I grew up playing Streets of Rage 2 and consider it a hugely nostalgic and fantastic game. After 25 years and a lot of continuations that never saw the light of day, it just seemed like there'd never be anything done with this series again. So hopping on voice chat with him and discovering just how good this new entry is was one of the highlights of the year for me. We were in pretty much constant bliss. The game's divisive graphical style continually charmed me, I found its music to be a worthy follow-up to the original trilogy, and quite incredibly, the game just feels like Streets of Rage should, while quietly adding in a lot of tricks that expand a player's brawling options in fantastic ways. This is a Streets of Rage game that you can genuinely lab some combos in, and it still feels completely natural. It would have been so easy to make some of these changes and risk the game feeling abnormal, but it's a continual delight. Beat'em ups are a hard genre to nail. If enemies move in just the wrong ways or have uneven placement throughout a level, or if the flow in combat feels just off enough, they can easily become boring, too easy, or too hard. It's another way in which a lot of very subtle things can add up incorrectly and taint the experience. This game more or less nails everything and consistently layers in new enemies and mixes them in with the older ones at just the right times to keep you on your toes and fighting for every inch of your health bar. It may risk running a little long, but the high points easily help mitigate that. It's the kind of game that only gets better on replays too, not only because it gives you a chance to try everything again with a different character, but because your score on each level is continually contributing to unlocking the characters from the first three games. At first, I was so bummed to not see Skate return, though Cherry quickly scratched that itch. But no, the folk making this game were looking out for me. I can straight up rock through this game as Streets of Rage 2 Skate with all of his old tricks and quirks. There's also a versus fighting mode you can mess around in. Uh, it's hilarious for a few rounds just to really nail in how broken some of the old characters are, but the real meat is that main story mode. Streets of Rage 4 is one of the most satisfying gaming comebacks I've ever experienced. It's trite to compare it to Sonic Mania at this point, but in terms of a new team coming in and infusing new ideas into old traditions and making a fantastic new experience, 
they are very similar. This game immediately became my new favorite in the series and is my go-to when I need to scratch that beat em up itch. And at the end of the day, it's still a beat em up. You'll either love it or just simply have no interest in it. But for those of us who have been yearning for a new game in the genre to champion, this game is a godsend. There was also one more Switch game from March that I beat, and it's one that I've forgotten to write about in this video twice now, which may give some indication of how I felt about it. I, I take no pleasure in this, but Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX is a title that just came and went for me. Kind of like with Animal Crossing, I, I can't really point at it for anything it did wrong. I liked the way it remade the original game, I liked a few things added from later entries in the series, and I did enjoy going through it again. I played the DS version of the original game over and over through my teens. It's a very nostalgic touchstone for me and Pokemon during a time where I felt a bit disillusioned from the main games. I may have held it in too high of a regard, as I mostly just walked away from this remake a bit gloom. It was still good, but not quite the hell of a game that I remembered it being. I still enjoyed it enough to recommend it, of course. If you played the original, you'll enjoy seeing how closely adapted it is from the original. But it's kind of ironic, too. I often look forward to remakes of my beloved childhood games with a bit of skepticism. You know, like, what if I play these games again and they don't hold up? But the Crash and Spyro remakes delighted me. Rescue Team DX is an outlier, a game I let myself really look forward to, and it was the one instance where it didn't quite match my nostalgia. And that's just how it be sometimes, though. Conversely, 2020 was a great year for open world games I wasn't sure if I would enjoy or not. I went into Death Stranding excited for its narrative and timid about its gameplay, and dozens of hours later I was hooked on its gameplay and not caring much about its story. I enjoyed how hokey a lot of the characters were, and the few times Norman Reedus bothered to engage in a conversation with other characters I found myself invested, but for the most part I was just letting things happen and worried more about working toward more efficient ways of getting packages across this increasingly unsettling world. The slow and steady grind of continually convenient upgrades and transportation mechanisms fired directly into my brain and kept my dopamine plenty happy. I absolutely did not think I would become so entranced with it after watching my buddy Alex play for a stretch of time, but I just couldn't put the gameplay side of that stranding down. I was excited to see how Death Stranding would differ from Kojima's prior project, The Phantom Pain, but I found myself feeling pretty similar to it all in all. Interesting characters utilized in ways I found uninteresting, with a simple core gameplay loop that hooked right into my veins. I'm still not sure why Troy Baker had to lick people though. Far Cry 3 Classic was 3 bucks at one point, so I went ahead and jumped into it and <laughs> accidentally got so sucked in that I got the Platinum Trophy. All I really knew about it going in was that the villain asks about the definition of insanity at some point, and by golly does he. By today's standards, the open world of Far Cry 3 seems a bit quaint, but I think the simplicity of it relative to today really helped me get into it. I was really surprised by how much fun I had just going across this island doing the usual dumb open world things. It's got a lot of small quirks that haven't aged well, but if you're itching for a simpler time, grab this on sale sometime for a few bucks and see how laughably edgy Voss is with hindsight. I was also lucky enough to get a PS5 pre-order somehow, and since then, I've played a lot on it to make sure I was getting my money's worth out of it. I immediately went through Miles Morales, but I've talked about that game more in depth over on FTCR, my other channel. It's also where I talked a ton more about other great games I played this year like Persona 5 Royal and Final Fantasy VII Remake, so I'll be disquoting those games from this video for that reason, but suffice it to say I enjoyed each quite a lot. That brings me to when I got COVID at the start of December and was out of commission for a few weeks. And if you see how much of this video is left, you'll realize I played quite a bit after that. Some of you have very kindly asked how I was doing by the way, and I just wanted to say I am largely doing better now. I still have some leftover effects from having it, such as randomly having a harder time breathing and my voice being subpar on some days, which is part of why this video and others have taken me so long. I, even sitting here recording this one, I, I'm just out of breath sometimes. It's, it, it all hasn't been fun. Hey, but how about segues? What has been fun that I didn't see coming was a full-on PlayStation 5 version of Shakedown Hawaii randomly releasing. You might remember this game from my review of it from back in 2019, and thanks to the game being crossed by, the review code the developer gave me back then entitled me to this new version. I was curious to see how on earth it implemented any PS5 features, but even more curious to play it again since there had been some updates in the time I'd played it that addressed some of the critiques I had of it the first time. As you can probably tell, Shakedown Hawaii is a top-down pixel art GTA homage where you play as a failing CEO trying to escape bankruptcy 
and a hostile takeover from a rival corporate type. Much like GTA, a lot of the humor is satire, and the humor of this boomer CEO just throwing every single idea at the wall and hoping it'll stick is still funny. The main critiques I remember having was that the property management system gave you too much money too quickly, making the end game of it rather negligible, and that the actual shakedowns you do in the game to help make those businesses available for purchase were too repetitive. There's a lot of businesses you have to persuade into paying you protection money in the game. So the economy rebalance did a great job. Even after the story was finished, I was still having to manage my investments and scrounge for money, so it's more fulfilling to work for that now. But the way later updates addressed the repetition succeeded while fumbling. The way the issue was handled was to introduce new types of shakedowns. And when I encountered them, I found them to either be funny or entertaining, but so rarely did I encounter them that it still wound up being too repetitive as a whole. If they had been mixed in more evenly to replace some of the existing scenarios, it would have helped, but it didn't go quite far enough for my tastes. Still, this is a really neat game and a great way to kill 8 hours or so. It starts to wear a bit thin by the end of its runtime, but if you want something different, I think this will be right up your alley. I then tried out Bug Snacks and accidentally got the Platinum Trophy in that too. <laughs> Oops. Bug Snacks is the game that made me realize I really like weird worlds with mysteries. To a certain point. I was fascinated with the idea of what Bug Snacks was, and as I got into it and found a delightfully odd game, I was in a really great place. I think my buddy Wolf Chaos on and I independently came to the realization that this game is like a weird Digimon world game, wherein you're trying to bring back residents to a deserted town. Except instead of a meat farm, you have a condiment farm. Uh, still makes sense. Going through each area and trying to capture each bug snack was fun, uh, frustrating once in a while, but ultimately fun. However, as the mystery unraveled, I started to think back to my time with Death Stranding. Especially with that game, I had years to ponder and think about what the hell was going on with that game, and similarly, the more things were explained, the less enraptured I was. So getting to the end of Bug Snacks was weirdly melancholic. I enjoyed the journey, but as I got to the destination, I just went, yep, I guess this had to go this way. I'll remember Bug Snacks fondly. It has an immensely unique charm, and just thinking about some of the characters in it makes me smile. But I think I'll remember the intrigue of Bug Snacks even more fondly. From there, I wanted to check out the PS5's backwards compatibility for myself, so I decided to make myself fully commit to a game I had started and stopped a few times over the past few years. Infamous Second Son. Before this game, I'd played some odd hours of Infamous 2 that I don't really remember anything about. I, I really love the Sly Cooper games that I've played, and I've always wanted to play through this series to see how the DNA evolved from those games to these. Unfortunately, Second Son isn't really the place to start with that, and didn't do much to leave a positive impression on me ultimately. I'll say though, as a PS5 showpiece, it's fantastic. I don't think I noticed a single frame drop for my entire time with it. The power of the console brings it from a meandering above 30 FPS to a practically locked 60 FPS. Outside of pre-made cutscenes that run at 30, it's buttery smooth throughout. For being a launch window PS4 game, it still looks fantastic too. The aspects of it that have aged stand out quite a bit, as pretty much everything else could have passed for being much more recent. So in Second Son, you play as Troy Baker, aka Delson Rowe, who absorbs superpowers from an escaped detainee and teams up with his begrudging cop brother to go to Seattle and stop the woman who turned their fictional tribe into part concrete. I really think the reason Second Son sticks in my head so much, despite me not liking it very well, is that it has flashes of being great. The woman I just mentioned, Augustine, is performed extremely well as a cold yet not entirely unapproachable villain character. Half of my drive to finish this game was just to see more from her. The game also gives you a nice brief glimpse at the relationship between Delson and his brother, whose name I'm about to google, one second, Reggie. As that detainee escapes in the early moments of the game, he accidentally knocks a vehicle onto Reggie, who is trapped while discovering Delson got superpowers, a thing that is very frowned upon in this society. Troy Baker is so overused that he's kind of a meme, and Travis Willingham is just kind of being Travis Willingham here, but they're both who they are because they're good at what they do. There's a very short and effective scene where they're both just kind of freaking out and coming to grips with things and reaffirming that they have each other's backs despite their differences, it really sets the stage for both of them nicely. And at this point, I'm invested and I'm liking it. These characters just had an emotional moment, and then the scene ends and you're back to gameplay where there's an immediate disconnect in their performances where Reggie is preaching to Delson and Delson is immediately very defensive about his powers. The stage was set, 
and then the overhead lighting falls from the ceiling through that stage and immediately kills it. There's a lot of this in Second Son, and as the game went on, I can't say I found any of the characters within very likable beyond Augustine's role as a villain. The gameplay itself doesn't really make up for things either. It's fine, getting the few superpowers you do throughout the game and upgrading them are entertaining, but the game's fisticuffs combat often feels sluggish and weirdly difficult to contend with. I died so often in this game because it just feels so strange to actually fight. I always felt like I needed just a few more tools in my belt to really manage larger scale encounters, tools that I didn't really ever get. Additionally, it's an open world game without much interesting to do. Essentially, Augustine's private military company has locked down Seattle, so the premise is that you're going district by district and doing things that lessen her concrete clad grip on the city. Surveillance drones and hidden security cameras that watch citizens are there to be destroyed, undercover PMC agents need to be beaten up, bases need to be destroyed, but it very rarely feels fun. It mostly just feels like a chore. But despite all of this, I 100%ed a good karma run of the game and then turned right back around and did the same for the evil storyline and worked to get the platinum trophy. I, I did a lot of that in 2020 for some reason. With Second Son, I think I just really wanted to like it and tried turning over every stone in hopes that it would click with me at some point. It didn't ever really happen. Naturally, I moved right on to its standalone DLC expansion, Infamous First Light, in search of filling that void. I'd played quite a lot of this when it was first given away with PS Plus years ago, but I couldn't really remember any of it, so I started a new game, and hey! It's pretty neat! The game gives you those few extra tools for your combat arsenal, and despite reeling in the amount of things to do in the game, the extra focus on what is there helps make it more fun. It supplements this by placing collectibles throughout the same version of Seattle that you can use to upgrade yourself. Traversal was one of the more enjoyable parts of Second Son, and the character you play as here, Fetch, does so even more capably than Delson did, so it kind of becomes a fun platformer at a point. It was fun to look at how high some of the collectibles were and wondering how on earth I was supposed to get to them. The story here is mostly about how Fetch was detained by Augustine and exploited to draw out her powers, and leads right into Second Son's story with Fetch's escape from the detainment facility. In a much shorter time with much lesser ambitions, it tells a more capably affecting story and provides more fun than its beefier main game did for me. And yes, I got the Platinum Trophy here too. PlayStation Studios really seem to like making these side story games that shine a spotlight on the different characters. Uncharted Lost Legacy and Miles Morales being the other examples, and I'm honestly all for it. I still want to plug my PS3 in sometime and play the older Infamous games since it doesn't really seem like those will be brought to modern hardware anytime soon, but I'll get to that sometime down the road. On the subject of time, after First Light's release in 2015, Sucker Punch went quiet for a very long time. Once in a while, a rumor about what they were up to would get out there, and a couple of times someone would quietly whisper that whatever project they were working on really wasn't shaping up well. So when their new game, Ghost of Tsushima, was shown in 2017 and then finally released in June of 2020, I gave the trailers and information a chance every time it surfaced, but it just never looked fun or interesting or grabbed me in any way, really. So the game came and went, but in recent months, the Golden Bolt had been talking it up and selling me on it, so I used up some gift cards when it was on sale for the holidays and gave it a shot. And let me tell you, it was a slow burn for me. For the first three hours or so, I was kind of just going through the motions and not really having any of it stick for me, but at some point that changed and I became hooked and put over 60 hours into it. And yes, I got the Platinum Trophy here too! Ghost of Tsushima does very little that is new, and in many ways it doesn't innovate much on prior titles in the jam-packed genre that came before it. It feels a lot like a lost Japanese Assassin's Creed game, the exact thing I and many others hoped we'd get a long time ago. Its climbing is simple like Uncharted, its traversal is mostly by horse, and the combat is literally like that old-style Assassin's Creed combat, just without a fully trustworthy lock-on. Uh, bafflingly. But it captures lightning in a bottle by doing so many things that other games have done to death by doing them and making them fun again. I really can't put my finger on it, but filling in the map, going and doing every single side quest, and unlocking new combat styles for the game's rock, paper, scissor, dynamite fashioned enemies, just everything about the act of playing this game commanded my free time. And Ghost of Tsushima actually drops some conventions from the genre, all for the better. The wind is your guide in this game. You can place a pin on the map and keep opening it up to see how you're doing, but generally you just get some text in the top left telling you how far you need to go, 
and a swipe up on the PlayStation controller tells you where you need to go. I'm curious if this was a genius design decision or just a sly means of forcing you to look at how hard they worked on the graphical prowess of this game, as it is gorgeous. Again, I'm fortunate enough to have a PS5, and much like with the infamous games, it makes this game run at 60 FPS in engines, and at times it is sincerely breathtaking. The game has an incredible command on color usage, and despite taking place on one small island in Japan, the deferring moods of locations within is staggering. There were times I had to remind myself that this was all on an island that's just 43 by 9 miles in real life. I haven't touched much on the story since the game is so new, and despite its high sales, I feel like a lot of people I know slept on the game, so I don't want to spill much of the beans. The narrative is the one aspect that I think is better than I expected, but also left me wanting it to rise higher than it does. Um, to try and keep this brief, the game follows fictional characters set in the actual invasion of the Mongols to the island of Tsushima in the 13th century. You play as Jin Sakai, who continually struggles with the moral balance of sticking to the samurai code his family instilled in him, and undercutting those morals to save his people. Each of the characters in the story surprised me, uh, even one character I initially found pretty annoying I warmed up to by the end. I, I feel like each of them got to have a cool moment, and it was pretty rewarding each time. Kind of like with Second Son, the narrative has flashes of something excellent here and there, but rarely reaches those heights. Thankfully with Ghost of Tsushima though, the game supporting those excellent moments is far better by comparison. This game was truly a huge surprise for me. I had zero interest or expectations, but I can say now that it managed to be one of my favorite games of the year. Would I be so effusive over it if my expectations weren't at literally zero going in? Probably not. But it doesn't affect the fantastic time I had with this game either way, and it's a time I'm thankful for. I'd also like to shout out the game's free online expansion, Ghost of Tsushima Legends. This is a whole separate mode from the main game that repurposes a lot of assets from the main game and divides them into separate chunks draped with really cool new aesthetics. There are around 9 story missions that you can play solo or with a friend that see you fighting alongside Japanese legends, and also a few wave-based survival maps where you defend areas from incoming hordes. These are all just mindless enough to make them fun to play again and again, and it's neat to just level up one of the four classes and unlock better gear and work through their skill trees. It's nothing incredibly fantastic to write home about, but for an entirely free expansion that can add probably a dozen or more hours on top of the already lengthy main game, it's really hard to complain about. So I played a ton of mainstream games this year, and I really wish I had a higher number of lesser talked about games to mention in this video, but one that I can talk about, thankfully, is Sayonara Wild Hearts, since my buddy Calico Plus hooked me up for Christmas. A few people very kindly gave me games on Steam that I need to make time for, but this one runs at about an hour long, so it was really easy to squeeze in. There are certain games I look at and just know that they're me games. Like, just from a glance I can tell that I'll love them. Sayonara Wild Hearts hits just about all of my boxes, and even some boxes I didn't know were on my list. It's got an arcadey charm, it doesn't overstay its welcome, it features an original electronic pop soundtrack, it oozes style, and it isn't afraid to wear its inspirations on its sleeve. It's a highly concentrated and euphoric experience from start to finish. The kind of game you play and just immediately feel that special something with. If it isn't entirely clear from looking at it, it's an action game where you automatically move forward through levels, where the action will sync with portions of songs. It's also very clever. Again, this game is only an hour long, but in spite of that, it never rests on its laurels. The game is constantly throwing you into new gameplay environments and adapting to new situations on the fly. I really don't want to spoil much because part of what made this game stick with me is how constantly it surprised me. Uh, really, my only complaint is due to my own ability with the game. It demands some reaction time to keep the flow going all the way through, and it's so disheartening to be fully absorbed into the experience and then crash into a wall you barely saw coming. The game is immensely generous with its checkpointing and you'll find yourself right where you were more often than not, but it's like a loud noise scaring you when you're absorbed into something else. Which speaks to just how immersive playing the game can be. Sayonara Wild Hearts gave me a similar anesthesia that Tetris affected, so if you enjoyed that game at all, you need to play this game immediately. This one was truly a delight to experience and comes fully recommended from me. And with that, we're about at the end of this video. There are a few more games I want to talk about, but they'll be getting their own dedicated videos soon. I meant for them to come out closer to their releases, but hey, that's life. It was a great year to lose myself into a ton of games, but I should probably talk about my favorite now. 
And I apologize in advance. It will make you groan. It, it kind of makes me groan too, but no matter what I waited against, the best experiences I had when playing a game this year came from The Last of Us Part 2. I really wasn't even that taken with the first one. It's another game I tried to get through over the years and it just never stuck with me, but I, I somehow never had the ending spoiled for me, so in the lead up to Part 2, I decided to make myself get through it. And it was fine. I, I enjoyed it. I was just always more of an Uncharted guy when it came to Naughty Dog's modern stylings. But I just had this interest in part two that I couldn't shake. Like, for me, it's like the equivalent of a new Justin Timberlake album or a big budget Hollywood movie. I just need to see what practically blank checks and crunching employees, in this case, oops, results in. I love gaming and I always want to check out what the Premiere Studio is doing. And in terms of fidelity, this game is ridiculously impressive. You can feel neglected spouses and kids and pets in some of this stuff. Truly next gen. But we all know that already. If you have an enthusiast interest in gaming, which you likely do if you're watching a channel as small as mine this far into a video, you're sick of hearing about this game. Whether you love it or hate it, this feels like a specter over all of our heads that we just want to move past. But try as I might, I just can't stop thinking about how tense I felt and all of the best ways engaging with the gameplay. The additions to your arsenal in part 2 were mocked during their marketing. <laughs> Yay, I can jump and crawl now! But it's not the move set that flushes the experience out, it's the environments you can utilize them within. There are a few areas in this game that are like, I, I, I don't know, like a jungle gym. Like there are all kinds of ways you can slither in and out of combat scenarios, stealth your way around, escape and reassess a situation, and just generally plan a fucked up Rambo situation. The experience that sticks out most to me is one of the suburban settings shown in one of the trailers. I, I had found myself trapped upstairs in a house with very few options to hide, just cycling through the rooms and dodging in and out of the windows onto the roof as enemy after enemy filtered in and screamed about the other characters being killed. I, I can't convey it to you how I gripped my controller with whitened knuckles, but I was just in an element, just completely not even here anymore. I was fully absorbed. I'm coming to terms with potentially undiagnosed ADHD in recent times. It's hard for me to focus on anything for long when I want to. This video alone I rewrote three times and it took me a couple weeks to even do that, so when a game can grip me and make me forget about everything else, I cherish those moments of absolute clarity and focus. When I got through that encounter, I, <laughs> I had to take a break and breathe. I, I can't remember the last time I needed to do that from a non-story moment in a game. It was wonderful. As far as the story goes, it's a great story to experience and not think much about the finer details afterward. As you probably know by now, the game has two playable protagonists, a rough eh, three-fifths as Ellie Last of Us and two-fifths as Abby Last of Us. Ellie's side of the story has characters I immediately liked a lot more, but their motivations are often one note and their dynamics rarely shift. Dina, an incredibly likable character, essentially plateaus for a long stretch of this game. And as fun as going out as Ellie for her first half of the game is, it boils down to go out and kill someone involved with a certain murder, come back to a hiding spot, play in the next murder, and then go do it again. Fun for gameplay, not fun for a longer narrative stretch. Meanwhile, Abby's side of the story features some less likable characters wrapped up in a more involving plotline. And when Abby meets up with Yara and Lev, two runaways from a local religious cult, it really picked up for me and I had to know how it would work out between the three of them. Yeah, some of this game's best story moments ironically feature no one from the original game. And I think that helps bring me to my takeaway, uh, the biggest shame about the huge mess surrounding this game's release last year. It was so hard for people to not get swept up into over-defending and overrating it, or knocking it for absurd reasons that often didn't even exist. The Last of Us Part 2 isn't a perfect game, or even a masterpiece. It's an incredibly solid game that is more often than not fantastic, but has such obvious quirks and flaws upon retrospection that drag it down. But there was just a black hole surrounding this game that made it impossible to talk about those quirks, to critique it and really dig into the things it gets right and the things it doesn't. I hope someday the storm around it completely dissipates and it can be dug into, and if you're blissfully unaware of how crazy things got before this game came out, I really envy you, but it still feels like we're not quite there. So again, I get it if you groan about me saying this was my favorite game of 2020. It's definitely hard to shake the impression that the folk who made this game were trying to craft some prestige masterpiece of the medium, but if you give it a shot, I think you'll find an incredibly mechanically satisfying game that could probably have used an editor for its overall length and maybe a second opinion on some story beats. 
Also, if this means you can't trust my opinion anymore, I'm sorry, and I'll make it up to you when I do the incredibly long Evolution the World of Sacred Device retrospective. Okay, thank you, I love you. Hey, so that was an overly long video of me talking about a grab bag of random games. Hopefully it helped kill some time for you, at the absolute least. I feel like in 2020, I got a fair bit done on this channel, but not much of it was what I actually set out to do at the start of the year. So, with what I mentioned about my attention span a bit ago, uh, let's just see where 2021 takes us, shall we? I've had some ideas burning in my mind for a long time. I'll either finally turn those into reality this year, or veer off in another direction yet again. I appreciate you sticking around through the please play it's and the learning to love playstations either way. I want to help you find cool games to play at bare minimum, so as long as I'm helping you find something interesting here and there, I'm happy. It should be an interesting year though. Hopefully this time next year I'll get to talk to you some more about another batch of things. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons for their support, with special thanks to Goldstorm07, Buckles Chucklow, G, The Crazy Even, The Legend of Groose, Patrick Thompson, Svendelica, Wolf Chaosan, Joey, Harry, and Adrian. And Adrian.